So we move on to the next uh, presentation, which will be by Gauri Ramachandran. I'm sure she's here. Yeah. Okay, that's her. Um, so she's. I have to raise it to my. Okay. So she's a trustee at the Institute for the Advancement of Vedic Mathematics. Um, she's a driven learner with diverse skills and interests, including social entrepreneurship, arts and crafts, ethnomathematics. Ethno that's a new term, and Vedic mathematics. A passionate educator with an ability to collaborate and lead geographically and functionally diverse teams and to connect with an audience in an engaging learning process, instrumental in curating, creating learning resources and training educators. I know that she has collaborated with Indica on a, uh, on a conference, right? Uh, so she's going to be speaking about uh, games, educational games, traditional games that can be used for education. So over to you, Gauriji. Um, when my daughter was four months old and uh, clinging on to the tradition was very important to me because the place where I stayed in Philippines had absolutely zero Indian population and uh, playing games was one of the means of introducing her to my culture which I grew up in which I'm passionate about. I did learn Vedic mathematics for the same reason too and uh, look where I am with <laughs> Institute for Advancement of Vedic Mathematics. But uh, when uh, when this came up, the Indica, when this came up and they said, like, educational games, I tried to implode the games I played as a child and, and try to connect where the education is. Because when I was teaching Mahati, my daughter, I was always trying to not just teach her the game, but also see what she can learn in school can be put here in this game. And incidentally, many games which we played as kids were there in Philippines also. <laughs> so uh, this... Uh, Presentation is about uh, is not about how we are applying those games into education in the current era, but about how or, 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 or try to inquire about where these games were placed or where the education value was placed in these games when they were played. Are actually if they are, is it in a formal setting or informal setting? And that's what I was trying to inquire about with these games. Oh, okay, it goes. Yeah. So uh, to make an inquiry, I just tried to break the whole um, inquiry into four parts. Um, so the the first part is the introduction, Adhikari, where I, I try to... This doesn't stay on. <laughs> Uh, where I try to uh, think or, or, or see what is my uh, you know, goal of this whole uh, inquiry is about. Um, then comes the Vishya. I took up five games here. Uh, the five games are Palangori. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm like by birth a Tamil, so I, I, I like to you know, hold on to that. Uh, the five games are Palangori, Adupuli Atam, Paramapadam, Anjangal and Pachisi. Uh, Pachisi is the tayam which we play as kids or uh, uh, this thing. So these are the five games I took just to limit the scope so I don't waver too far away and, 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 and go far away. And then try to connect these five games and what are the learnings which these games were you know, supposed to have been. Are they just gameplay or did they have any learning with it? Um, that was the next question or putting them together. And then finally come to a logical conclusion to it. So that's going to be the whole talk about. Um, again, when I was discovering or trying to, okay, there. When I was trying to talk about the five games, I, I, I had like four aspects, or, uh, or trying to inquire about four aspects in those five, in, in the games. The first one was history and what historical context the game had, whether it was played earlier days or it's just like we are getting it from our grandparents. Um, the second one was um, uh, how to play the game. Uh, the third one was the significance of the game. And then the educational content. Those were the four. But here, uh, in this, for today, I decided I will only you know, uh, continue with uh, talking only about the history and the significance and not go into how to play the game, because I know the audience already nodding heads. I believe all of you have played those games as kids. Um, so. 
uh, again, like I said, what I'm trying to find out here is that crucial link that these games played uh, as recreational play, because we know them as recreational play, did provide educational values in them in an organized or an unorganized setting. That was my idea to try to find out. This is just an inquiry. Now next. OK. OK. So the first one is Pallanguri. Uh, this game is widely played in southern India. And uh, uh, like how we call it Pallanguri, it's called in different names across southern India. Ardhuli Mate in, in uh, uh, is it audibly money, right? No. Yeah. In uh, no, this is uh, actually yeah. It's it's played widely in southern India. Uh, where is the earliest reference, or where do we find references of this game? Um, uh, it's it's mentioned in Ramayana. Actually, that it's said that Sita played this game in Ashokavana. So it it is widely present in maybe the Tamil culture where it's it's very in southern India again, and and then they're also. Mention of this game in copper plate inscriptions of the Pallava kings. These are the written or written evidences where we can find that this is like somewhere from where we belong to. But then um, there are also stone carvings in Mahabalipuram of this game. So they're like holes dug in temples. Uh, just this proves that this is a very social game. It's, 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 it's played in a very you know, common area in a social setting and in, to interact it. And, uh, the places apart from southern India where this game is played is across Southeast Asia all the way to Philippines where I was there. So it's called Sumka there. And I saw the game there. I thought, oh, no, this is Palangri. It's not Sumka. And it's, it's, it's my game, not yours. But then interestingly, they also claim that it is their own game. It's been played by them for generations. So now why or how it traveled till there, we can actually infer with the conquest of Cholas. So if you see the game is played across Southeast Asia and also in Southern Africa um, as Mankala. So where it traveled is where the Cholas have actually traveled. You know That is why probably this, this game is played across Southeast Asia. Now coming to the significance and purpose, this game was majorly played by women, and, and, and still, if you see, we, have, we, have, we must have played it with our grandparents, grandmother, mostly. Um, for leisure and entertainment is the most you know, thing which uh, you know, we can come across. Um, but later on, when, when I put it together, I'll tell you how you know, they have used it as understanding about the sowing and reaping in agriculture, actually. You know, and uh, they actually played it. During the free time, the agricultural women used to play, uh, who, who do agriculture used to play. So it's a social bonding. Again, you know, it's, it's played together as a group. It's a social bonding. It plays with. And there are also certain customs and superstitions with this game. I don't know if anybody had heard. Like my party used to say that don't play this game after sunset. So, you know, there, there's a, I don't know the reason or I didn't include the reason, but every game had their own customs and superstitions which were passed down. So this game also had it. The next one, moving on to the next one, is Adupuli Atta. This is very interesting because when I was trying to find out where it originated from, there were two different factions saying one came from Himalayas and one came from southern India. Both were true. Uh, the game boards were slightly different. What I'm showing is in a temple in, here, in, in Tamil Nadu, in Chennai, actually, which has this game carved on one of the walls. Um, but when I went to Nepal, I found out that they played the same game. They called it Bag Shell. The board was slightly different, uh, uh, actually very different, because it's a square board. And then the number of coins used is also different. In Adipuli Atam, we use three tigers and 15 lambs. And uh, in Bakchal, they use four tigers and 20 lambs. So that's the major difference. But the way the game is played is still the same. Um, the very important factor in this game is the asymmetrical nature. The number of coins divided between the opposing parties is not the same. And also the strength of the coins. You see, the tiger has more power. And the lambs are just there to be eaten by the tiger. So it's, it's, it's very asymmetrical, and that's very unique with this game. Um, so tactics and strategy is very important. I always lost the game when I was playing. Be it whether I took the tiger or the lamb, it did not matter. I always lost it. So um, there a very important thing. What we are learning with this game is the strategy and tactical thinking. But then there's one more thing, or the concept. If we are thinking of olden days, what they are trying to teach us with the game is the concept of predator and prey, and how to preserve the nature, or how nature holds itself, um, in, in, in how the balance or equilibrium is maintained. 
Moving on to Moving on to the next game, Paramapadam. This game actually had uh, the most, or, or in its phase, it, it did show that there is education here, there is a learning here. Uh, right from starting to play the game, you know that you're learning from something from this. When you uh, try to dig the history or the where the written mention of the game is, it is said that it is believed that it is, you know, invented by Sant Gyandev. So in 13th century, and it's called Mokshapat. But for me, it is Parvapadam. We play on Vaikundra Egadasi Day. So there is, there is a lot of interaction between uh, various regions, and it, it is re-termed in all parts of southern India in different names. The concept is still the same uh, of learning virtues and vices. So you learn good things and bad things, and there is a chance here. So everything what comes in our life um, is not by of, of thinking or action, there is also a chance involved wow, what happens in our life. That is the major learning that comes with this game. But then the other thing is, if, if you are good, you go up the ladder. And you know, you, if you're bad, you come down the snake. So that's the, the major learning which goes off. And each square, whether it is empty or it has a ladder or a snake, each square has something in it to teach us a value or a virtue in this game. So, where the learning is clearly defined among the five games I had inquired, this had a clear definition of the learning happening while playing the game. And it is said that if you play, again, customs and superstitions with the games, probably is given down generations without knowing what it is, they would have a reason. So it is played on Vaikuntha Egadashi Day in at least in, in Tamil Nadu, it's like definitely played on Vaikuntha Egadashi Day, where, you know, uh, why it is played? Probably, you know, because you're supposed to be awake all night. And when you're awake all night, you can just not be listening to satsang, but you'll have to do something else also. Playing a game encourages you, but then, no, you're not just playing a game, you're learning something also with it. So that's the reason behind it. So going, moving forward to the, yeah. Next game. This really surprised me when I was doing the inquiry with this game, actually. You know, I thought it is very, very regional or, you know, um, uh, Nagraj Garu was actually telling that you throw the, you know, um, uh, actually it's called uh, the tambourine sits, you throw and catch it. And I thought it's really regional. I really thought it is from Andhra Pradesh where I grew up. You know, and then my party comes and says, no, no, we also play it. And then everybody else comes and say, no, no, we also come, do, do play it. And then when I started researching, it's, it's, it's actually the most widely played game across the globe. Uh, right from South, South America to the Philippines to, uh, you know, uh, Australia. Everybody or every indigenous person has played the game and also claim it that it is their regional, you know. Like in Korea, they call it Gongi. And uh, they, 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 they really think all the kids who play the game, really, it's very regional for them. And uh, or in America, they play it with jacks and a ball. So it's, it's just still the same game where they throw a stone or a similar thing and catch it. Here, the main uh, key idea is to be like, understand the hand-eye coordination. And who plays this game? They are young children who play the game. Uh, we don't see mostly adults playing the game, but it's, it's mostly young children playing the game, trying to finish all levels. So the levels also differ with the region where they are, you know, you throw two stones or you throw one stone and, and, and catch how many they differ. But the idea behind the game is please learn hand-eye coordination. That is the starting thing for any child. So where I was trying to think what is the education behind it or what are we trying to learn with um, Anjangal is when I, 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 when I came to know that it had actually prehistoric origins. It was not just it. It was all over the globe, but then it was also found in the prehistoric caves of Kyiv in Ukraine. And it's also found in Greek pottery. So it, it, it's, it's really ancient and probably the most ancient game I came across with, with, with my study when it comes to inferences of where this game is played. Um, so why, uh, what I understand is, if it is so prehistoric, uh, why are you learning this? It's, it's hand-eye coordination and very young children. Then the inference is that young children need to know the targeting skills. If it is prehistoric, they, they should be able to learn hunting or uh, other skills at that time. So, and uh, probably that is the reason this game is widely played by very young children before probably a formal education in their field is started. So you have five minutes more, huh? Yeah. So the last game is Chopper Apachisi. 
written record it goes to Akbar's court where you know Akbar loved playing this game and in fact in Fatehpur Sikri there is a, a, a big game of uh, chopper there uh, but the mention that Abdul Fazl did was uh, was more important here where he said that this is played in Hindustan from times immemorial so we don't know the date but it is a Hindustan game um, Again, uh, you know, they are uh, just um, different ways of playing. Chopper is used, use, uh, uses the long elongated dice, and the Pachisi uses the five shells. That's why it's called Pachisi, because the maximum score there is 25 with the five shells. Interesting point to note is that this game is copyrighted in the USA <laughs> as Parchisi in 19, 1869 by a person called John Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but uh, yeah. Uh, Anyway, um, significance and purpose, it, it finds it mentioned in other ways as a, uh, as a tool for gambling. Now, gambling and education, how can, you know, we think about it, right? And we also seen it in Mahabharata, that how kingdoms were lost with this game. There are many other influences in Jataka tales also. But then in Jataka tales, there was another influence where it said that the king actually started knowing to predict what is being thrown by the by the dice and once he knows that it is not going to be favorable to him he will hold the dice mid air and ask the opponent to throw again till he gets a favorable so it, the the chance or learning of probability here the science of probability here is 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 being like even though it is for gambling even though it is shown as or it's 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 like recorded as kingdoms were lost but then um, king still played it to understand what are the chances, what, how you can predict, how you can, you know, probably, you know, win with, with just a game. So these were the five games. Um, yeah. So uh, what is the connection we are making with these, or I try to make with these five games? I just chose five games. I didn't, uh, like I said in the beginning, that I didn't want to expand too much. So understanding these five games, which we played as kids, and how these can help us, or understand that was there any education? That was my question first. Or was it just a child's play? So there is a common thread with these five games, which is going on. All the games was a, was able is able to be played with just materials around the house. Um, they need not have, uh, you know, lot of gadgets, except Paramapadam, probably where you have to, you know, have a game board which has the virtues and vices written in it. Every other game can be played with just materials you can just gather. I know playing five stones, wherever there is a construction, I run there and pick, try to pick the right kind of five stones which will not hurt me <laughs> to play the game. Um, so uh, it, 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 it can be played easily with just things around the household or around the area in a social setting. It is a com uh, it's a community thing, it's a social setting. Here, uh, you know, um, and it's a casual setting. Um, so it's, it's not like a formal uh, setting where you, you play these games. Now, what are the differences? There are two strategy games which were uh, explored. One is the uh, Pachisi and Adpuliata. Both involves a lot of strategical thinking and understanding the opponent's next move is very important in these two games to be able to win it. Uh, the opponent may be strong or weak. Here, you know, especially in Adpuliatam, you know that you know your opponent can be a tiger, <laughs> and he has more power than the lamb here, who can uh, control using just with number here. So there is a strategy there, and um, in Paramapadam, the education, like we, we discussed a little earlier, the education is completely defined. Like you're learning virtues and vices, you're learning about a game of chance here. And uh, when it comes to Palanguri, the concept of sowing and reaping. So you take the seeds and you, and you scatter it around. So it, uh, understanding that mere fact that it is played by agricultural workers, they have to think that what I sow, somebody else will reap. Uh, so there is a very important learning here while playing the game that, you know, it's not just you. I, I'm not going to accumulate wealth by myself. Like wealth accumulation happens and a distribution happens. And um, that's a very important learning there with Palanguri. And for five stones, like we discussed, it's about it's it's about the fine motor school skills and hand-eye coordination. Um, later on, I think, you know, you, you start chanting or, you know, starting a memorizing skill with it. You know, so that you throw the stone and you, you keep memorizing. So uh, those are the five things. And to bring them to a logical conclusion, there are, um, again, three um, parts to it. One is the positioning in the society, where, you know, uh, we, we, we kind of outwardly see them as just games. 
we play without knowing that there is actually a learning behind it. So, and mostly these are in a very casual setting. They're not in a formal, like there, there is not a gurukula or a, or a teacher doing it. We are learning it as a child's play. Uh, so that is the informal or the formal sector. Except Parampadam, every other uh, game is actually played um, in a very casual and informal setting. Uh, and probably Pachisi also is played in a formal setting where the kings used to play it. It's, it's, it's more like kings and rulers used to play the game. And lastly, you know, to, to try to conclude or bring it together, they're not, uh, they were just games when we were growing up, but when we start investigating more on them, they had more meaning to it. They had more uh, knowledge to it. And, and playing these games, probably, you know, getting the kids out of the gadgets is more important these days. But they also have a lot of other things which can be taught to the current generation or the current schools can adapt it as tools for education, especially like things like, um, uh, you know, Paramapadam, where uh, even if you take the virtues and vices path, there are numbers one to hundred. Early learning, you can start adding, counting, and things like that. And you know that's how I started with my kid actually, and and, and things like that. So, but then the, the three important aspects which these games bring is one is the logical reasoning, and uh, putting history and economics together here when it comes to the games, and also the number systems, trying to understand the number systems. Um, that's it. Uh, uh, these are the few references, and I would. I'd like to thank for giving me a chance to talk about this. Um, uh, before I was, uh, I, I'm a chartered accountant still, but uh, being a researcher is more like being a mother. I, I did this as more like a mother here. <laughs> and, uh, and thanks for giving us this opportunity to be able to present it. And uh, I would like to thank Swati here. She is the one who pushed me to do this research. And I would like to thank Nagraj Garu and Sahana Singh for the right guidance they had given me when I was actually started doing the paper. And thank you for patiently listening. Thank you, thank you. Please stay there. There'll be questions, I'm sure. Are there any questions? You have a question. So in my book, I have uh, uh, on uh, India's educational heritage, I have a chapter on games. But in that, I took up uh, the snakes and ladders, moksha patam, chess and cards. Of course, those are the most well known. And uh, are, both of them are so deep. I mean, chess, you can see how much of how much it, is, uh, it has advanced. And uh, today it's just a game. But in those days, it was being used to uh, teach strategy to kings. So it was part of the uh, teach, uh, training of kings for uh, governing. Uh, yes, that's a question, right? It was such a great presentation. I really enjoyed everything. I just had to ask this, like, while playing Paramapadam, this, I don't know if you felt it, but like every time I played it, I used to feel like you mentioned by chance. Uh, so do you really believe that it happens by chance or, is it, or is, do you think that this is like something that we trace back to Purva Janma? Or, uh, okay, I will leave that for the Sanatan Dharma talks, uh, which we do, but uh, just looking at it as a game. Okay, the next one goes off. <laughs> But looking at it as a game, it's, it's definitely the role of dice is the chance. That's why I said it is by chance. But to understand uh, Purva Janma, probably we'll have to take more into the Advaita philosophy and the Sanatana Dharma and all that. Um, I think uh, not this dice, but definitely sometime else we can implore on it. Uh, why I ask this is because we feel that it's not fair. When I get a snake, I go down. What did I do to deserve this? That's the kind of questions you get, right? right. Like, why am I going down? What did I do? wrong I didn't do anything wrong but then how do you explain yourself why couldn't I eat other she yeah so it is connected it is there it is there yeah and this goes yeah the whole thing connects to Bhagavad Gita Sukha Dukhe Samekritwala Bhala Pachiyaja. The whole I felt the whole presentation was like talking about this verse in so many examples. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. We made the students play Palavari. Oh, it was so thrilling. Nice. Oh, that's okay. We got it and we taught them how to play it. And we played Palavari. Uh, not a question, it's just an observation, not even an observation, just something that I came to know that in the Mysore Palace, uh, 
Mummadi, Odeyar and Nalwadi, both of them were very, very, um, they were very invested in games. You have an entire wall of uh, chess uh, that has been, uh, uh, board games, uh, designed by the Maharaja of Mysore, specifically Mummadi and Nalwadi. And so the tradition, it's not just one form of chess that the entire wall is full of uh, chess and strategy games and a uh, lot of innovation there, very beautifully rendered. I believe the Maha there is so much there in the gallery, in the Jagan Mohana gallery where they've displayed uh, the board games that were actually created by the Maharaja. This is just for information, not a question. Thank you. One small point. In Ayurveda, there is a concept of Krida Bhumi and uh, toys in Ayurveda, but they talk about it not as a learning tool, but as a to observe development developmental milestones in children. So I, I just wanted to bring that like, and you talked about five stones, you just get it from the construction site. So in Ayurveda, they mentioned about making with the goduma, like with wheat flour, mm -hmm. making toys that are sustainable. Yeah, I just wanted to talk. Uh, thank you, madam, for a very enlightening presentation. Just two small uh, comments, not, uh, you know, you mentioned the game of dice and Chaucer. We have sculptural panels in India, in say for example in the Elephanta Caves where Shiva and Parvati are shown playing that game. Yes. And uh, my PhD guide, Professor Suraj Pandit has interpreted that whole panel as Leela. It is teaching, you know, the fact that Shiva and Parvati are engaged in Krida or Leela is actually a way of telling the devotees that the whole creation is actually nothing but a Leela or Krida for the deities and we are nothing, you know, but just simple toys in their hands and a number of cave sites, rock cut cave sites, especially the Shaiva sites in uh, Maharashtra, they have a number of these games carved on the floors. They, they are, yes. of course, carved much uh, later after, I mean, later to the, um, when the caves were excavated, but we do find, uh, even, right, even in the Kailasa temple at Elora, we do find such, uh, you know, Carvings. games uh, carved on the floor. So that, that's yes. just what I wanted to add. Thank you so Thank much. You. So, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Just an observation, the second game that you mentioned, Adi, uh, I'm just forgetting its name. Adipuli Atam. Yeah, so I, that actually is also played in Odisha. So Bhatshal or you play it as uh, lambs and tigers? Yeah, no, lambs and tigers. Okay, so we call the it triangle uh, version. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank you for taking me on a nostalgic <laughs> trip. I had forgotten I played when I was a kid. Welcome. And, uh, uh, in yeah. fact, uh, the other version, the North Indian version, Bhatshal, um, it's, uh, it's claimed to be the national game of Nepal. Um, uh, and uh, they sell it to all tourists. Uh, but when I saw the researchers, they said that it's actually a dying game. So most of these games give us nostalgia, but uh, unfortunately with the gadgets in hand, they are not played anymore. And as you mentioned, the game actually teaches you the balance between the nature. You know, the tigers are less, but more powerful. Deers are Is more, the number but of their quotes. powers are less. So I actually haven't thought from that perspective, but uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, just wanted to add one thing since you were repeatedly mentioning right here in the last row. Um, so you were repeatedly mentioning how children are addicted to the gadgets. So uh, I think the IK's uh, wing of the MOE has brought an app called Buddhi Yoga, which is available in your um, app store, not the iPhone one, I think. Uh, which is an adaptation of Paramapadam and very interesting. Nice. So that would be a wonderful way to adapt it perhaps to gadgets as well. Uh, yeah, Thank true. you. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, two things. Uh, uh, one, as an organizer, uh, curator, we received four proposals on a single game, Paramapadam. And <laughs> some of them dropped out, some of them have to be rejected and all that. Uh, yours uh, includes uh, Paramapadam as one of them. I think still we have one more on Paramapadam itself. Let me talk about the Mahatmyam of the foreigners. 
uh, I was talking about the Mahatmyam Punya coming from the foreigners. I some time ago received an email from Jacob Schmidt Madsen, postdoctoral researcher in Indology, Department of Cross Cultural and Regional Studies, University of Copenhagen, Denmark. This was about Chaupar and Pachis. He was using these two, Chaupar and Pachis, as synonyms. And uh, he mentions to me in the trail of emails between me and him that he defended a PhD on uh, Pachisi uh, earlier and he sent it to me for a review, my comments. And uh, then he went on for Chaupar and then through the thread of the emails he was mentioning that an archaeologist from Krishnadeva University, Anantapur, already did his uh, work on uh, Pachisi from Telugu literature and he was basing his work on that and he is getting a postdoctoral degree from this um, and once these things get published they get a Mahatmya yeah. they we can talk of the town oh Pachisi foreigners have done it <laughs> it must be definitely something really very great and all that so this is from Denmark Interested in Chaupa, Arpa, Chisi. I was helping him with Telugu literary evidences and all that. So probably all of you now might get interested. Re, all these minutes when she was talking about, we thought it was something very funny coming from some person interested in some games and all that. It's a PhD topic, postdoctoral, Denmark. So it must be really very, very great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you thank very you. much.